Good afternoon, everyone. Over 100 peer-reviewed papers showing that sun drives the climate dismissed by the IPCC, as well another staggering 1,350 papers totally dismissed by the IPCC that show other arguments against CO2 warming. I included a list of 130 climate scandals for your viewing. One of them is the grand hiatus. From 1945 to 1975, it cooled, yet CO2 was increasing because of our industrialization after World War II. There's also been another hiatus in global warming for almost 19 years. Greenland, for the second year in a row, above the 1990 to 2013 mean average. Seven years had less ice than this year globally, blistering 51 below zero Fahrenheit in Colorado but it was colder once in 1989. With the IPCC just finishing up their Paris session, I did want to bring to your attention, there have been a lot of peer-reviewed papers over the last, say, seven years that have just been totally swept under the rug. And you'll continually hear global warming proponents saying that, oh, there are no peer-reviewed papers that say anything other than CO2 warming. Well, I'm gonna give you a list of almost 1,500 right here. The first set is purely sun driving the climate. One of my favorites, number five, solar forcing on the winter severity index in the Baltic Sea. I included a link below so you can go directly to, all of these are hyperlinked out to the entire PDFs and academic journals so you can read for yourself. There's literally more than a thousand of these papers I'm going to reference for you here. Next one from Popular Technology, 1,350 plus peer review supporting other causes for the warming than CO2 on this planet. I also like the second one here. It talks about the air temperature differences between solar maximum activity and solar minimum activity. So look at the other 1,500 papers that are in this collection and then draw your own conclusions. Add into this 129, it's actually 130 climate scandals. They go through everything that's happened over the last seven years. It's really interesting reading. Again, everything's hyperlinked for you to go out and find your own original research. One thing that I pulled up right away, midway down the list, was the uh, grand hiatus. I'm very familiar with the hiatus that's going on right now, the pause in global warming, where the Earth's temperatures haven't risen in 18 years and nine months. But there's also a second hiatus from 1945 forward after World War II up to 1975. And that was a major cooling event after an exceptionally large El Nino. I went to Wood for Trees, created this graph, overlaid it with the colored center lines there for you. You'll notice right back at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, there was a warming spike, yet there wasn't a lot of CO2 being produced industrially at that time to have a full effect globally. Yet it warmed significantly. And then it cooled significantly as well when it should have been warming after World War II. It's the opposite of what we've been told. It was warming when there was little CO2, yet it was cooling when the CO2 was increasing after World War II. Now, over the next couple of years, entering into a grand solar minimum on this next solar cycle, 25, just a lot of things don't match up. And that's one of the reasons I'm putting out this information on my channel. I want it to be a truth platform. I want to give you a lot of resources so you can take into consideration the half-truths being given to you daily in the media. Now, since the pause has been going on for such a long time, there's now 63 different excuses from the global warming crowd trying to explain away why it hasn't warmed in over 18 years. The funniest one I came across when they were talking about Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean cooling causing cooling. And I was like, wait a second, isn't that a natural cycle? So how do they explain away cooling, yet it's CO2, yet the oceans are driving the temperature, not CO2, but they're using ocean driving temperatures to give a reason why CO2 is not warming everything, which is right back to where we started, solar cycles and natural variability that drives the climate on our planet, not CO2. Even at the very top of the list there, the hockey stick puts in, number one, low solar activity. Yeah, we're going into a low solar activity phase right now and probably late 2017, 
The winter of 18 and 19 is definitely going to be exceptionally cold. I believe that's the first year that crop losses will happen and it will reduce the yield globally on wheat from 45 north is the winter of 2018 and 19. Global Mean here from RSS. Bob Tisdale again does a great job comparing the 97-98 El Nino with the 2015-16 El Nino. You can see it's a little bit cooler. Not nearly the Godzilla Nino that all the global warming proponents were saying was going to happen this year. It didn't metamorphosize. Southern Hemisphere ice anomaly above the baseline. Global sea ice totals through the end of November. It doesn't include December. In the yellow circles below that I included, you can clearly see there was less ice seven years out of the last 15 years than there is this year. Weather station hits minus 51 Fahrenheit in Antero Reservoir in Colorado. Now, if this was a heat record, it would have made the national news of the lead story. Now, I know for sure you're going to ask me, well, what's the comparison? Is that how cold is that really? So here are all the other dates. We have to go back to 1962 to find something like this. Also, a new news story came out. The headline reads, Greenland has lost 9,000 billion tons of ice in a century. And it sounds like an enormous number. But there are a couple people who have great math that went to great lengths to try to really show you how much ice has decreased from Greenland. So let's get into the math. Now, Dave over at What's Up With That converted the 9 trillion tons into metric tons and then converted over into gigatons and then used out a water weight variable there from the gigatons per square kilometers. Further going on with the total mass, we're talking about ice sheets that are 2,000 meters thick and the total volume in square kilometers minus this 9,000 billion tons. 99.7 of the ice is still there which means 0 0.03 has melted off over the last 100 years. This is a radar cross section of the ice sheet itself. Again, 2,000 meters. That is over a mile thick of ice. And the total melt amount has only been five meters off of the entire top of that. That small little red line that you see at the top is the total ice loss off of Greenland. Now remember, this is five meters off of the top, yet the entire ice sheet is 2,000 meters thick. Greenland melt extent in 2015, the red line, as you can see clearly within the 2% deviation, as well as several months were below the 1981 to 2010 average. There was only a couple months where it was above. Here's the striking fact. This is the second year in a row that there's been ice gain significantly above the 1990 to 2013 running average. This is becoming a trend. A wide variety of publications to try now to say that warming is causing all of the snow. Warming is causing the cooling. The end effect of warming is cooling. And I see this repeatedly in the news again and again. It's trickling, but it's turning into sort of a stream flow now. I grew up being told warming meant warming, and we were going to cook like frogs in a pot, and uh, there would be no snow for our children. There would be no ice on the lakes. There would be no ice in the Arctic. And now they're flipping it and saying, warm equals cold, so there's more snow now because we told you it was going to get so hot that there would be no, more snow. The cooling trend is here. When we get into the winter of 2017, that should be the after effect lag of El Nino cooling off. When we get into 2018, 19, it is going to cool significantly. They're going to have to try to explain it away. And as always, thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. The realization that there's actually thousands of peer reviewed articles out there that say something contrary to the CO2 warming myth that aren't even considered or debated or talked about. Well, we're going into a substantially cool period where we are going to lose crop production in the northern hemisphere. This is going to lead to food shortages around 2019, slightly, but 2020 forward, we're going to go back and repeat something like we did in the 1600s. When the bakers and those that had access to food were some of the wealthiest people in society, food is going to become so precious and so valuable 
And we should be talking about ways to mitigate this and get other food growth strategies in place planet-wide in advance to these declines. And the only possible reason that I can see that it's not happening is it's a purposeful plan not to let everybody prepare. You can take that any way you like, but I think the impending economic collapse is going to be to lock people down so they cannot travel to warmer destinations, buy tools, buy seeds, things you need. This should come approximately one year before the actual food shortages and cooling is so evident that you, as a citizen, are just going to start asking too many questions and demand answers from your politicians. At that point, you're going to be considered a threat because you want answers and you've been lied to so greatly that your life, your family's lives, are in danger from lack of food. This is the end game it's going on to. You know, some things I saw and some people I talked to over the holidays, things are going to be changing quickly here. You're going to need to prepare yourselves. The next video is all about what's going to happen from 2020 out to 2025 at the very earliest, and then what's going to happen out to 2035 and a little bit after.